Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Great Mondays Radio. Uh, it's Josh Levine, your host. And today I'm very excited to bring on Joel McDermott, the Vice President of Talent and Culture at Corwell Health, um, which is a uh, statewide health provider in Michigan. And um, I asked Joel to come on because he has this really interesting way of clarifying what culture is for his leaders across his organization. And I thought it would be something that um, a lot of our listeners would be interested in kind of thinking about or adopting something similar. Um, it feels really compelling. And Joel, like you said, revelatory for some of your leaders. So that's what we're going to, uh, revelatory sounds amazing. Let's do it. Joel, thanks for coming on Great Mondays Radio. Fantastic, Josh. Thanks for having me. Uh, appreciate you coming on. So um, uh, talk to me, just tell me a little bit about uh, kind of a little background. You are vice president of talent and culture at Corwell Health. So what's your kind of scope? What do you oversee? What are your responsibilities? Yeah. So uh, is it okay to say I'm still figuring that out? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, so so, so uh, I've been with the organization now a couple of years. This is the first time in my career that I've actually had culture in my formal title uh, and was brought on because there was a large integration where we brought together uh, two of the, the larger healthcare systems in Michigan into one uh, about two years ago. And culture is at the forefront of importance for our CEO, for our leadership team, and for our organization. And how do we take these two great historic uh, cultures and create maybe something even better uh, out of both of them? And so my team uh, has stewardship over uh, culture shaping. Uh, we also do we do things in the talent management space. So anything that has to do with coaching or mentoring or career development uh, for people, performance management, uh, change management, org design, all of those fun things. So there's always things to keep us busy, uh, but basically focusing on the team member experience, either through the services that we provide to them or the culture we create for them. How many uh, how many employees uh, is Corwell Health? Uh, it's, it, it's usually around 65,000 is the number. All right. So this is, we're no, 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 uh, small, small business that you're, you're dealing with here. Right. Um, so this is the first time that you've had culture in your title. Um, was that, um, like, was that daunting? Was that exciting when you first thought about it? Had, had, had culture been something you're like, well, now. Uh, you know, now officially it's in my title, but I've been doing this all along or you're like, well, now I got to, like you said, figure it out. Where did, how did culture come into your world? Because there's more, more of these roles, I think of talent and culture, people and culture are sort of showing up. And I'm just very interested in kind of, you know, who's showing up for these roles and how they kind of came there, got there. Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a little bit of everything you said. I would say, um, for the most part, in my 30 years uh, formally being in HR in some way, shape, or form, I feel like I've always been creating culture in some way uh, on different levels and have always just been fascinated by it, right? How are the, how are the ways that you move behaviors and, and thinking at different levels to create something even larger uh, kind of corporately? And so... Um, what would interested me about having it in the, in the title and, and kind of scared me also a little bit was the intentionality of it. So I think, you know, I've been an HR business partner. I've, I've worked in leadership development. I've led OD functions. I've done things like that. And every one of those is really essential to culture. But to actually have it as part of the name, the nomenclature in the department was yeah. so intentional that I was like, OK, all right, I, I really have to look at this because that intentionality, I think, is something that's really attractive, not just in building culture, but in the sustainment uh, of it. And I mentioned it was a little scary, uh, too, because then it's like, OK, so my team stewards culture. So now what does that mean? That means that we have to try to take all of these disparate pieces, none of which we own, and help sort of harmonize them into a direction that creates a, a different feel of working here in the future. Yeah. Um, so when you came on, it was, it sounds like it was pretty, uh, pretty close right after the merger. Is that correct? It was. Yeah. So um, can we talk a little bit about what that was like? Um, what challenges did you face? You're probably still facing them because that's, that's a big, big deal. What are we, what are we talking about when we're talking, like when you're like, okay, intentional, da, 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 and then boom, it smacks you in the face. You're like, oh, here's, here's a big challenge, right? You're bringing two orgs together. Were they similar? Were they really different? Did they have to adopt or adapt or they're trying to? Yeah. 
Yeah, so so you were spot on by saying there's still challenges we're facing today. I mean, culture is such a long game uh, that I think we're constantly making improvements. But every time we make an improvement, we uncover something else we want to do or, or a little bit different than we want to be. Uh, what was interesting about these two organizations is there was some work done initially, some assessment work, even before I came on board that just really evaluated the cultures of the existing organization. So we could kind of get a current state of, of what they looked like. And it rated them in different types of things, everything from decision-making to risk-taking to uh, communication to things like that that would just be generally important uh, to people from a cultural standpoint. And I think the biggest learning for me when I got these piles and piles of data and we were able to summarize them down was to say, our two organizations were not that dissimilar. Uh, coming together. So I was, I, I breathed a sigh of relief initially, like, oh, this is easy, right? <laughs> the same until you start asking the question of the sameness we have, is that who we want to be in the future? Does that fulfill our future mission? Does that make us who we want to be? Uh, and the answer in most of the cases was no, uh, not that who we are, or who we were was, was bad in any way, right? I think it was just, it left a lot of room for improvement. There's some hierarchical elements that just exist in healthcare. Is that, does that create the kind of innovation and courage we want in our organization? Yeah. We can sometimes, are we slower to decision-making? How does that help or hurt people? So, so then we had to say, do we, do we need to be different? And if so, now we're moving 65,000 people towards a new future, which can be a little bit more challenging, but ultimately rewarding. And so that's the journey we've been on is really, you know, we redefined our values and we rooted ourselves in those, uh, which we do have consistently across the organization. And now we're working on everything else uh, that touches our team members and, and makes up culture. So, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's sort of uh, what I walked into and what I've been working with along with hundreds of other uh, team members across the organization. Can I ask you what your, what your values are? Yes. So uh, there are five C's and I'm going to, I'm probably going to get them wrong now because I'm, I'm on the spot, but <laughs> well, that's, I was going to say, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, I'm, I'm All right. Around. Five C's. All right. That's a good anchor. Five point. C's. So you can help me. Compassion, uh, collaboration, uh, clarity, courage, and curiosity. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, what was the process you went through to, to figure those out? So it was already in flight before I came here, but I can kind of speak to what the team was doing, which was yeah. really, really good, which was using some of that work, that analysis of work, and, and also looking at the values that existed in the two organizations mm -hmm. and saying, what's missing is, you know, because the values were very similar. I think everyone in healthcare, you know, the compassion is very strong. Of course, right. Collaboration was, yeah. was all throughout it. The yeah. one we added, so there were kind of four that the, those other four, you know, emulated from both. The one we added was clarity. And so uh, if you think of like, like Simon Sinek will tell you that, you know, you know, scale creates distance, right? So the bigger you get, the more distance between your frontline team members and your, your yep. senior leaders. Um, we already, I think on both sides, were wanting more clarity throughout the organization in our communication, mm. transparency and where we were going, things like that. Um, and we just felt that that was now going to double and become more complex overnight. So adding clarity to our values, I think, was a reflection to our team members of how important it is for us in the future to focus on that uh, and to truly believe that we're here to provide clarity, uh, not just to our team members, but to our patients and their families and our plan members uh, that, that we encounter. And that's uh, that's a tricky thing. That's one of those things that you kind of always aspire to and can be better at, but yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're always going to struggle with that um, in an organization our size, but added it to our values. So that's how that that came about. Any big moves inspired by that? Any big projects that you're planning on? Like, what is the action? I'm always curious about how values are actually, you know, come to life inside the organization. So when you're like, okay, here's clarity, uh, really important, everybody nod their head. So what, right? Yeah. What happens now? Yeah. So, so, well, what we've been, what we've been attempting to do is first of all, to make, <laughs> to make them a little bit clearer uh, by adding some behavioral elements to our values. So, so that people can see a more consistent example of what we mean. So we, we mean transparency by this, right? Those are the kind of things that we mean when we say clarity. 
Um, and then we've built them into areas that are very visible to our team members. So they become the how portion of our performance reviews uh, mm -hmm. would be those values and those behaviors in there as well. They're aligned into all of our strategic planning processes now. So how do we align the things we do with our values in the organization? And they're usually talked about at the 5C level, uh, but the behaviors come out from underneath them. Mm -hmm. And then how have they influenced probably our biggest piece of work, which we'll be rolling out later this year, which is our culture commitment. Uh, and our culture commitment is uh, in essence at its root an employee value proposition, but it's a little bit more that really defines for our team members and actually with our team members as we co-created it with them, uh, what who we want to be culture-wise in the next two years. So mm. it's not a current state assessment, but you know it's got some elements of caring for each other and connecting the dots that aligns with clarity and coming up with better solutions, which aligns with courage. And so, so how do we bring that to life for people in their own words so that they say, well, you talk about, you know, collaboration. Here's what we see that as, as an organization and what we want more of. And so yeah. it's reflected as sort of not only the basis for, uh, but the way we articulate our culture commitment in the future. I like, I like that time frame. That's really, that's a really interesting way. So you're, you're essentially prototyping or painting a picture of what we would like it to be, but it's not so far in the future that it's, you know, it's such a big stretch. It's like, I can just see over the hill. It's going to be hard to get there. And so I think that two years is, uh, that's great because it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm crap, I'm behind, but it doesn't feel like, well, I don't have to do anything um, right now. And so if you're holding you're holding, uh, uh, if, if you've taught your leaders to hold or you are teaching your leaders to hold their employees accountable, i.e. some of the in, in integrating that into some of the those reviews, then you've got kind of both that both sides of this um, uh, kind of movement, right? If you're looking on a graph, you've kind of two brackets. You're like aspiration on the right, holding you accountable on the left, moving us along. And I think that's really that's really compelling. Um, okay, so let's get into this this um, uh, this this analogy that you came up with. So the problem, just uh, des describe the problem for me that you that inspired this inspired your kind of way of painting this picture. Yeah, I, I can. So, uh, and and I know a lot of your listeners are, are are folks who are experts, right, in culture work have worked in it for years, and so maybe some can relate to this feeling where after you've worked in it for a while, you kind of get it. It's a little bit like the matrix. You look at it and you see it differently than maybe you saw it 10 years ago uh, or 20 years ago. Well, the issue there I was finding is as I'm talking to people about culture, I, I especially some of our leaders, I'd get nodding heads and I think that they were getting it. But at the end of the day, there was still this element of confusion, like, hey, I get it. Why don't they get it? Right. So uh, trying to practice a little bit more of what I preach is, how can we take a concept as a theorialist culture that that doesn't take 30 years to understand and bring it into uh, this this sort of uh, an analogy or a story that everybody could relate to? And more importantly, because, you know, our leaders, obviously, you know, very bright people are all smarter than me. Right. So if they're not getting it, it's not because they're not understanding it. It's because I'm maybe not communicating it as clearly uh, as I as, as I need to. Right. It's um, a, there's a disconnect between my understanding and theirs. And so by bringing in this story example, I found some common ground in between our two understanding where I could anchor to certain examples mm -hmm. that folks could get. And most importantly, really maybe help some of our leaders see what's your role. Uh, in this culture, because I think that's another thing our leaders were struggling with, which is everybody's on board with culture. Everybody wants to create this to be the best place to work. Uh, there's no question on that from the top to the bottom of our organization. But what's my role? Uh, right. So great. I went to this workshop. You know, Joel, you leave the room. Your team leaves the room. Now what? What do yes. I do? Right. right. And so how do we help them understand at, at, at a, maybe a different level what their role and responsibility is, both up, down and sideways in the organization? That is a that is a challenge I feel like culture leaders have, which is um, so number one, defining it is has always been a challenge. And you can kind of, uh, you know, describe it, but but actually getting it is a whole different thing. And the way that you're articulating the idea of like, OK, uh, how, what do I do? You're like, I, in theory, I believe in culture. I think culture is a great idea. No one's going to say, no, I want a crappy culture. So. So you're so now they're wondering, they're sort of going, okay, I believe you, I believe this vision. 
what am I doing different? What am I doing today? How do I, how do I enact this? Right. Right. So, so yeah, so that's where we came up with the story of the city uh, kind of culture. And it's just now starting to roll out a little bit more broadly in our organization. So we're kind of early days of it. Um, but happy to talk about that a little bit more if that's where you want to chat. Yeah, about. let's do it. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. right. The awesome. story of the city. So, so, I mean, to keep it simple, I've broken it down into four pieces just because that that tends to work for the size of organization we have now. I think larger organizations could look at the example differently and smaller organizations could could look at it at a certain level as well. But we look at it from a city neighborhood, house or home, and family unit perspective. Mm. And so uh, in an organization our size, when you think about the city is Corwell Health. So 65,000 people live in this city. That's a fairly good sized city by anybody's standards, but uh, it is a city and, and every city has leaders and they have government and they have governance and they have rules and they have laws. And, and so the way leaders play in that is if you have a role that is system-wide, that is focused on the city. So the policies you implement, the things that you develop have to be good for everybody, no matter what neighborhood they're in, you know, that 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 then is your role. You're in city governance. Uh, and, you know, you're there to make sure people have the right infrastructure. You're there to make sure people feel safe. You're there to make sure that broadly the laws are fair uh, to the organization or, the, to, or to the city. And quite frankly, that the branding of your city and the reputation of your city becomes something where people want to move there. They, they, they want to come there, right? They, they want to live there. They want to visit there. And so what are all the things that you're doing for your city that, that make that happen? And then you work through neighborhoods. And for our neighborhoods, that would be a region. We have a very large region on the east and one in the West and one in our South area. And then we also have uh, an insurance provider, Priority Health, that is another city or neighborhood, sorry. So we have four neighborhoods. And what I love about the neighborhood piece, because I think this is where the real magic unlock happened for us, is neighborhoods are a melting pot of culture. Right. So neighborhoods are where culture is experienced. You go to any large city, you go to New York, you go to uh, you go to Chicago, you go to any of those cities. You can tell when you're in a different neighborhood, right? And there's just a different feel and the restaurants are there and whatever, but you still know that you're in Chicago. So how do you allow the neighborhoods to experience their own rich culture and actually yeah. that culture contributes to the culture of the city rather than the city dictating the culture of the neighborhoods? And I think that's that was a big unlock for us as an organization and it continues to be which is you can't mandate culture from the top. You can support it, you can model it, you absolutely should be the ones who are living it, but it should be something that when it's decided for the city, it's a combination of all the neighborhoods. So what already exists there? You know, we have hospitals in Detroit, we have hospitals in Grand Rapids. Those are two very different cultural fields. If you've ever been to Michigan, uh, you would understand east and west side of the state. How do we honor that instead of try to change it, right? So, and, and then at the same time, the neighborhoods have a responsibility to fall under the city. So you still have to be a good neighborhood within the city. You can't form your own neighborhood outside of the city limits. And so while we're honoring all the great richness and diversity and history that come from our neighborhoods, the neighborhoods have to find a way to translate then the city governance to their people, to the homes and to the families that exist. And so... Then we talk about homes. Those are our locations, our hospitals, our clinics, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the ones where on a very local level, and some of these might be single family homes, some might be multifamily dwellings because their size. But at the end of the day, they're decorating and maintaining and creating an environment in their home to welcome in a certain number of guests and to make sure that their family members are comfortable and safe there. And so our location leadership, our home leadership, then has a much more local responsibility for culture. And the same way in the neighborhood, they have to make sure that they're contributing to the culture of the neighborhood, that they're being good homeowners, that they're taking care of their properties, that they're voicing their opinions to the neighborhood leadership when they need to, mm -hmm. uh, but that they're also honoring their role in the neighborhood, right? Is, is that, you know, I live in this neighborhood and I need to be proud of it. Um, and then we have family units. And I know family units, I'm still thinking about that because there's some aversion to thinking of work as family. Uh, and I totally right. get that, right? right? right. I, I've even heard it's a red flag if any company says, we're family here. We're family here. You're like, you can't away. fire your family. <laughs> you should run away the other direction. And so, but I think familial units is the only way you can really think about it. If those are our departments. Those are our teams oh. that exist within those locations. And what I love about that is if, you know, that that's where culture actually hits. 
So the culture of a city, whether it's whether there's bureaucracy or whether there's pride or whatever, that is felt most deeply at the family unit level. And so what we don't want is we don't want our city government to be disconnected from the family units. And in an organization our, as large as ours, that can happen if we're not careful. So when we're making big decisions, where we're making uh, you know policy or culture, are we taking into account our family units? We've got some great listening surveys that we roll out throughout the year that that you know many of our employees participate in. Are we truly listening to them as family units, as as members of the homes in our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. right? And looking at them that way uh, is a little bit different. And so it keeps us from that mentality, I think, of mandating culture from the top down and instead saying, how do we create something beautiful from what already exists and maybe then just change some of the things that we need to change to be different than we are today? Because everybody's on a journey to be different than they are today. Very few people are satisfied with sameness. Yeah. So the, the family units help us with that. But, you, you know, in a large city, sometimes you can forget about that if you're not intentional about here, reach out to them. So that was a long explanation of, of, of the model. But I think it unlocked I, one of our leaders called it radically simplifying culture when I talked about that, because then I was able to articulate more clearly my thinking on culture. And I was also able to see some of their concerns more clearly uh, when bumped up against the model. I The reason that I love this is because there, and I often will see and advise um, my peers and my clients on, hey, there's some things that need to be the same across an organization, you know, big O organization. And there's some things that are going to be different depending on the different regions or locations or buildings or even floors. And so by putting it in this context, you inherently understand the connectivity between those things. And you can invite, everybody knows they have that. It's a shared experience. Everybody has lived in a city has you know has lived in a neighborhood has lived in a home um or a building and has some kind of familial unit and understand the 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 relationship and i think this is ultimately what a great analogy does right you're like oh clarification yep. how formal do you intend to make this in your in in throughout the organization as in um are you describing it tossing it off in the hallway or when you give a keynote to or all hands and you're like hey it's like an organ it's like a city or you know that's that's one maybe that's in the middle right and then in the the far one uh, further to the more formal would be hey we've written it down this is how we document it this is how we talk about it and then maybe on the you know unformal informal you're like i just kind of you know one to one talk about this where where is it where do you want it to be yeah i i think that's a really interesting question so it, it we just started using it i would say my team and i in earnest maybe a few months ago and i've i've used it at other organizations in passing i would say it's more of a tool in our toolbox yeah in those moments when people don't quite grasp the concept you can throw it out and i'm like oh it just hit me again maybe i should be reusing this right so yeah. So we're using it that way. However, where I see it getting traction is when we start to talk about things like culture action planning for something the size of like a region. If a region is 30,000 people, mm. right? And they need to start looking at how they communicate and their leadership and other things that they want to do to move the culture of their region. We can actually lay it out to show, okay, well, here's the city things that you need to align with. You can't be contrary to these. Here's the the house things. What do your different houses look like, right? Are they in different level of order? And what does that mean for you, right? So how are your family units feeling about your neighborhood? So it, it what I'd like to see is somewhere in the middle with it, because I think if you overly formalize it, uh, because I've, I've had people say, well, how does it pertain to this? It can fall apart because right. even, it's not going to be per it's not going like, to be perfect. Like, even city governance has its own problems. Imagine that. Right. There's no perfect city. Right. right and so right, I right. think the, the more you try to make it solve for everything, it doesn't quite work. But I think it works well at the ethereal level, at explaining the concept of culture. Okay. And it stops, I think at just really people seeing how they play in either uh, decision-making, diversity is a big one with this, right? So 
uh, mm. from an organizational standpoint? Are we benefiting from the diversity of our neighborhoods? Uh, are we really mm. looking at that and valuing the different way that people think and they live and the backgrounds they come from? Maybe not, right? So do we need to focus more on our neighborhoods? Does, does culture come more from the neighborhood at the beginning than city? So I think in that level of thinking, it works really well. Um, I think if I play the analogy out, like most analogies too far, uh, <laughs> it, starts, it starts to fall apart. And I wouldn't yeah. want it to lose the value it has kind of at that more ethereal level, that, that yeah. sort of relational level than it does if you're trying to assign everything to it. Yeah, that's so great. I'm, I'm already thinking, I, I, I think I want to pick up on what you said before, where it's like an even larger organization might, you know, might have a fifth level, a state you know, a state level or, yeah. um, I had done an interview last year with, um, my colleague, Emily at, uh, Microsoft, and she talked about it like country, state city. And okay. that I thought was, um, it, it's, it has the same potential, but I think you're being able to bring it down to that, like, Oh, my home, um, really makes a, makes a difference. It's a really nice tweak. Um, but I just, I would love to see more, more articulation of this, um, across organizations just because it is so radically clarifying. Um, let's wrap up and talk about what you're moving towards. So you are, you talked about your, um, culture, uh, what you didn't, I, I call it a culture playbook. What's the, the, the EVP culture commitment. the culture commitment. Great. So you've talked about your culture commitment. So that's being articulated. What um what's what form is it taking? What is, you know, you've got a huge organization. Like, is it you're also, I don't know, doing the city, you know, the, the city level. You're like, we're gonna do a parade. We're also gonna pass out leaflets. We're also gonna have people standing on the corner. Like, what how do you get that information into people's hands? Yeah, and that's that's actually what we're working through now, because especially in healthcare, I think it's always going to be a challenge in any large organization, but uh, you've got a large percentage of the population that because of their daily job, whatever, they're just not electronically connected, at least not to our intranet or other yeah. things. Like Deskless, right? Yeah, exactly. We can do a lot of slick things on what we call the well, which is our internet, internet. but uh, you know, we might have a few thousand people, 5,000 people out of 65,000 who access that regularly. And the number is probably more, and my marketing friends will probably kill me if I get that wrong. But um, <laughs> what happens is, though, you get you get all the way down to nurses, which, you know, not to be too graphic, but they're actually reading whatever's posted on the back of the stall door yes, when they have a moment it. to use the restroom, right? I was exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, I was that, like, that's that... the... Yeah. That's reality, right? Yeah. So so how do we get that to them? And so I think what it is, is there's an approach that takes some time, right? Uh, so this is not, we, we're well aware that this is not something we can just post on the internet and everybody's going to get it. Now, it may start there, and I think that's one methodology. Yeah. But the next methodology is how do we get something tangible into people's hands that they can carry with them? I found people like to carry things with them, whether they're on their badge or whether there's something else. What is the memento or the piece of the artifact that we create that brings almost a tactile sense to it as well? So we, we want to find something and we've got a few ideas in the mix uh, because one of the things we're doing with our culture commitment is we're actually also, believe it or not, HR is reaching outside of HR and working with marketing as they're looking. Yay! I know, what, what, what a revolutionary <laughs> concept, right? I've got a great friend who leads our brand in marketing and she's been working with me on this culture commitment. And they're creating some brand promise on the outside. How do we present these to people as two sides of the same coin so they uh, see that the culture we create selfishly for our team members ultimately reflects in our purpose, which is to give excellent care to our patients and their families and our plan members, right? So, and making things better for them. And so can we do something with that, right, tangibly, and that people can get, because if you talk to nurses or if you talk to our EVS or nutrition people, anybody who's patient-facing, that's what they live. That's what they breathe. That's what they're there for is, yeah. is it keeps them coming back is because they care for those patients. The moment we can say, well, that's why culture is so important is so when you're out there in those difficult things, what's filling your cup when you walk away from that bedside? What's mm -hmm. what's making you want to get out there again? And that's our responsibility for culture. And so anything we can do. So there is an element of that as well uh, that that will come in. And then I think the final piece that that we have is like anybody, most organizations I've seen 
kind of get off the culture roller coaster around the identity phase, sometimes the behavior phase as we we use identity, behavior, expectation, accountability as our culture framework. So they fall off on behaviors because that's when it stops being fun. The moment you start thinking about accountability, no one really wants to do it anymore. And we're committed to moving through that, right? So what I think we have to do is show our team members when we launch this culture commitment, how are we constantly proving to them? week in, month in, that when we do something, we're doing it to fulfill this part of the commitment. We're, we're connecting the dots back. We're tethering things back for them. So it doesn't just stay that thing on a wall, but it actually becomes a promise that we make to the organization. And we just show them, we have to show them on a regular basis how we're fulfilling it. And that gets again, communicated down in whatever way they consume information. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just, hey, we did this thing with benefits. This is how, what it fulfills there. So they did just don't, they don't feel like it's just this, ethereal thing that was done you're so connecting it back to strategy yeah exactly exactly right? i mean that's and and to me the the fact that you're doing that the fact that you're communicating that it's connected to strategy is almost as important as actually connecting it back to the strategy as i think you're saying like modeling did i get that right i mean i, I don't want to put too many words in your mouth but i'm i'm that's what i I don't know. I just, I just love to see it. And I, I think that's where that that's where you're thinking. That's what you're thinking there. And and I, somewhere our chief strategy officer is smiling when you just said that, because, because he, he sees the connections that need to be made between culture and strategy. So you're right, but it, it has to be so intentional because people don't necessarily make that connection. They're not going to do it. Just right. So how do we do it for them? And by doing so, it makes strategy more relevant. It makes culture more relevant. It makes everything more relevant and important. Yeah. And it brings, it brings culture just to bring it back to the beginning, right. From sort of this ethereal, like nice to have idea to actually business device, business tool yep. uh, that I think is where the ideal state, right? Like that's what culture should be. And that's what we're trying to move it out. That's my, you know, that's what I hope to do is, is move that forward. So um, I love that. So uh, can you, La the last thing you said, identity, your your sort of your model. Tell me about oh, the yeah. model. So identity, our framework. Yeah, the framework. Identity, behavior, expectation? Yep. I identity, behaviors, expectations, accountability. All right. So tell me, speak to, to that for a few, just a, just a minute or two. Yeah, it underpins everything we're doing from culture. So if you think about... Uh, identity. We went through that. We, we we formed a new identity, a new name even, right? When we became this organization and decided who we wanted to be uh, in the future. And we're kind of still in the process of doing that. So kind of like a New Year's resolution, you look in the mirror, hey, I like Joel, but I could be better. Well, I'm not going to do that by behaving the same way. So we're redoing even our competency model and the behaviors we've assigned with our values and things like that, that better align expected behaviors in the organization with our culture commitment and the culture we want in the future. So building in things like authenticity and things like that that maybe weren't there before mm. are now going to be part of those behaviors. And then we set expectations because those behaviors don't show up the same at every level. And so uh, how I expect to see authenticity at the highest level might look different than an individual contributor because the ripple effect of that. So what are the expectations we set by level? And then at the end of the day, we're asking the question of what are we prepared to do <laughs> when people in our organization don't live the culture that we've created. And I Thank guess you. the flip side always is, how do we reward them when they do, right? Yep. Accountability can be positive, yep. but how how do we hold them accountable? Because you, your, your culture is only going to be as good as the worst behavior you're willing to tolerate. So, yep. so how do you create that accountability where it's like, hey, we're going to try to get you back to Fulbright, but if you can't get on board with our values and who we want to be, then this isn't the city for you, right? There's lots of other cities out there where you can be a resident of that city, but you have to have enough of that pride and conviction in the culture yeah. of your city that you're willing to hold people accountable to living it. And so this underpins everything. And it's also part of our maturity journey we've laid out, which is about a six year complete journey to culture mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. that lists these things at various different levels. So, and I know we're talking about a lot of different concepts now, and you said we could geek out on culture. I guess that's what we're doing here. That is absolutely what we're doing. I was, I was ready to wrap this up and then you tossed that out there and I'm like, all right, hold on. Let's, we gotta, I gotta hear more about this. So I am, I'm all, I'm all here for it. That's great. Um, yeah, I love that. And I, I, I really appreciate, I think, I originally came from brand and I think about identity and you're talking about Corwell, but you're talking about the identity of the culture too. And that really, 
resonates with me because I feel too often that it's not articulated in that way. It's sort of more fuzzy. And, and that, that is ultimately, I think, a, a really nice way to kind of begin to, and again, paint that vision around what this means. What does that logo mean? What is our culture about? Um, do you guys have like, um, I was talking to um, the uh, a VP of HR at Lenovo and she talked about the Lenovo way. And of course there was the HP way. Do you, you know, that's kind of the way that they just, they talked about their culture. Is there a Corwell way? Um, or do you talk, do you, do you have a name for it? Do you, are you just, it's the Corwell culture? I don't know that we have one name for it yet. And that's been something we've talked about. I think as we roll out this, uh, this this collaboration between our, our our brand and our reputation and our culture that you'll see something like that forming right because I mean we have we have a strong purpose you know we're here to improve health we're here to uh, in, in, in to improve health to instill humanity and to inspire hope that's our mission right and it's a powerful mission so everybody can get around that but you're right there are some great companies out there who have who have branded it that this is the X way mm -hmm. uh, or the way, the way we do stuff. And I came from Kellogg uh, before this, right? So I get the brand stuff. I, I, I get it. Right. I think what we need to do is, is define it for people. And then I think that will emerge because I think uh, one thing we want to be careful of too, is before we call it the way we want to make sure that our people agree, this is the way we need to go. Right, and that's right, what right. we're doing right now. So I think you'll see something like that come out. I think there's a strong desire from our leaders for What's what's just the simple way we articulate what we've what's all the language? How do I talk about it? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and so I'll, I'll be transparent and say we're not quite there yet. We haven't found quite the right thing to do it. It's there. It's yeah. in the things we've created. We just yeah. haven't brought it to that clarity. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it, it sounds in the, in the just the few years you've been there, it sounds like y'all have made some really, really big steps faster than a lot of organizations. So your your patience and your willingness to also say, hey, this is going to take some time, setting those expectations with other leaders, I think is is also really important because you're right. Culture is a long haul investment, and that is a really important piece of this. Um, Joel McDermott, VP of Talent and Culture at Corwell Health. You can check out corwellhealth.org. Uh, Org, if you want to learn more, um, Joel, thank you so much for coming on, talking a little bit about your work, how you're moving it forward, some of the ideas that you're you you've battle tested, some of the ideas that are sort of rolling out there. Um, I think this was three. This was probably three episodes in one, three episodes of content in one. I could have we could have talked a lot about each one of these. Thank you so much for being generous with your time and some of these amazing ideas. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on Great Mondays Radio. Uh, Josh, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it.